Hi, this is a presentation on the spatial data infrastructure concepts and components. My name is Doug Niebert with the U.S. Federal Geographic Data Committee in Reston, Virginia. What is spatial data infrastructure? Well, there's a, a cookbook that was put together by the SDI and GSDI Association called the SDI Cookbook. And it has this definition early on as a basis for many national SDIs around the world. Uh, spatial data infrastructure provides a basis for data discovery, evaluation, and application or usage for users and providers in all levels of government, the commercial sector, nonprofit sector, academia, and by citizens in general. So really it's a baseline by which spatial or locational information can be used by people. The components that make an SDI work include four main areas. The first are the policies and institutional arrangements that make it possible. This includes governance, issues of data privacy or agreements on data privacy and security, data sharing and cost recovery. It includes the people and their training, professional development, the cooperation and outreach. The people actually do the work and make it happen. It includes the data such as base map or framework data, thematic statistical place names data, so when people think of a spatial data infrastructure, you think of the data, but really these other things are very important to making it happen. And finally, SDI is dependent on the technology to make it happen, the hardware, the software, the networks, databases, and the standards that allow it all to work together. So here's an overview of the elements and status of SDI, and I'll be building up to a this full diagram that shows the essential elements of a spatial data infrastructure in, my, in, my, in this set of presentations. <clears throat> the first element that's central, both in the diagram and to the core of SDI, is metadata. And so the first task is to inventory who has what data of what type and quality. A standardized uh, form of metadata, Metadata Standard, was published in 1994 by the U.S. Federal Geographic Data Committee. There's now an international standard, ISO 19115, and its XML equivalent 19139 that's available and is being adopted by most countries. Metadata can apply not just to data, but also to services and other resource types. The simplest form of metadata is to support inventory, and it might be done within a small group, which would provide documentation of resources within an organization doesn't require many metadata fields, just enough to be able to find files that a group is familiar with. The next level of metadata, next level of effort, <coughs> would permit search and comparison of these resources by others. So people outside of your office where you have to explain things a little bit more. And this we would call the catalog view of metadata. It allows for structured search based on fields like title and abstract, uh, bounding coordinates and things like that. A third level of detail in metadata would be what we'll call proper documentation, and it allows end users enough information to actually take the resource, take the data set or the service, and use it in an appropriate way. So without this level of metadata, it's very hard for an end user to do the right thing or even locate information. ISO 19115, as I mentioned, and the XML equivalent provide an international standard for metadata and its encoding. <coughs> so metadata can be used to describe services and data. This is for order, for access, or for local use. Metadata is used to describe all kinds of data with an emphasis on truth and labeling. So we'll have metadata for data sets that are not just the only official data, but also for things that are done for projects that may have dubious uh, source reference is really important to collect how good or how bad something is. Metadata is used to describe data, obviously, <clears throat> in its general form, most, most commonly used form, and we'll categorize data into two groups. One is framework data, which are common data layers, and general geodata, which are other thematic data layers. In the U.S., we've developed framework data standards for 11 data themes. They're being promoted right now as an American national standard with 11 chapters to it. And each one of these themes is described also in an annex in XML as well as 
Geography Markup Language, GML, <clears throat> in schemas that can be served over the web. Here's a list of the framework layers that are in use in the US. Uh, not coincidentally, within Europe and in other SDIs, these similar data themes show up. We have elevation, ortho imagery, which is scanned and registered error photos or images. Hydrographic data, which is water, surface water, say lakes and rivers and streams. Governmental unit boundaries, administrative boundaries. The cadastral or parcels layer. Geodetic control for control points. And five sub-themes of transportation that are, that are specific to these modes of transportation. Another principle of framework data is that it supports some kind of a common encoding. This would allow three different systems with different internal models of databases to import a common encoding, in this case in the center of the diagram, um, and in ingest it into the system. It also allows them to export it for consumption by others. So by adopting a, a framework data standard, you specify the data content and the syntax or the encoding of the information to promote this kind of exchange. In this way, any given system can know in advance how to process e the exact content coming for a specific layer. So if it's a, a data layer on transit and it's a standard schema, that data format is already decided for you. Systems that know that only have to write one uh, adapter in order to import that specific encoding of data. The NSDI also includes services to help you discover and interact with the geospatial data. There are three kinds of services, and the first one we'll talk about, the most prominent one in SDI, is a discovery service, and that allows you to discover resources through metadata, through the, the descriptive fields. The discovery service is provided by a national catalog of geospatial information accessed through a national portal. In the U.S., we have a geospatial one-stop portal and a catalog that harvests from over 100 collections within the United States. These national geoportal capabilities help people locate data and services. They support the direct download of data, link to related websites or applications for others to access, or they may actually have a link to email or an order form for data that are not online. These portals also often support communities <coughs> in, um, in areas within the website to organize and post and manage selected content. And in the case of Geospatial One Stop, we have the ability to also share data collection plans and requirements to support partnerships and collaboration. And here's a zoom in within the Geospatial One Stop, also known as geodata.gov is the website. We have a search bar across the top, which allows for both simple and advanced search. We have communities, which are tabbed over on the left side, that are oriented around special interest or events, such as hurricanes or specific disasters, and persistent data categories that tend to be associated with data content. We'll also have a, a pane in the middle that shows featured resources, kind of a map of the day or a project of interest to the general community. There are several ways that a publisher a, or a prospective publisher, a scientist, an individual who has a data set that they want to share, they can contribute into this environment. They can either enter it into a form on, in the catalog and they're stored and indexed there. They can upload metadata as XML from a program they already have on their desktop or they can register a metadata collection or service that their organization is managing to be harvested into the national catalog. Here's a further illustration of those three methods. So you can have, again, form entry or XML upload, or you can have a collection of metadata at your organization. Here we see four different organizations that have metadata catalogs and are offering their content into the general metadata, metadata catalog. So in this case, it actually goes and harvests the, all of the metadata records from each of these subcatalogs in order to speed search. <clears throat> the portal is the human web interface, human user interface, that allows for search on the catalog. And if there is a link in the metadata for, let's say, a map service, then map services can be rendered through the map viewer through a logical URL within the metadata. 
second major category of services provides for standardized access to geospatial information. This can be by static files on FTP or HTTP, but more increasingly and preferably, these are made available through web services. These access services deliver raw data, not maps. Here's an illustration of interoperable data access. Across the bottom we have example of three different databases and three different interfaces on those, each of which have their own means of interacting with end users. So clients would have to connect uh, with a special dialogue to each of these solutions. But because they all three adopt the same web map service interface, they agree to have implemented three operations, two or three operations, with the exact same request dialogue so that the the request that comes from a client, or a web server in this case, from a client computer, uh, can be the same going to all three. Again, just like with the framework data, this is a demonstration of being able to write a single client that can access multiple service targets. So a web map service request comes from the individual on a computer and can be sent, or say downloaded as a form, they can then connect to each of the three web map service providers and get a map resource back. And of course, this can go on to other distributed provider organizations with additional software of different brands, different vendors. But if they all support the identical map service interface, in this case WMS, then they're able to connect using the same form of a WMS request. The third type of services provides additional processing on geospatial information. This can be um, uh, web coordinate transformation services or fusion overlay services, but it's uh, less mature in terms of standardization within the geospatial world. It is being applied in a number of places and is increasingly be, uh, present within SDIs. Next area, building out this diagram, is standardization. <clears throat> Standards make the SDI work and they touch on every SDI activity. You can see how I tried to be sure that standards is actually touching or flanking every one of the, the main colored features within this. Standards include specifications, formal standards, and documented practices, best practices. Here's a set of SDI 1.0 standards, and we'll see an update to this a little bit later with more recent versions of standards that are in current usage. Partnerships extend our capabilities. Partnerships are the glue that hold all these parts together. If there weren't agreement on being able to publish data, consume data, share it, redistribute it, reserve rights and ownership, then it wouldn't be successful. There'd be no payload. So proper governance of the community is essential through a variety of roles and responsibilities that are called out. What is your responsibility as a publisher or provider of data? What is your responsibility as a librarian or steward or end user? We expect that national governments or non-governmental organizations, NGOs, would partner with other levels of government and sectors to promote two-way coordination. In most countries, there are multiple levels of government that collaborate together to try to acquire and standardize on the availability of geospatial information. But it's hard to do it alone, so it's important to involve the private sector, the public sector, universities, and others. The government or a foundation may be able to fund agencies with seed funding to further existing efforts toward common goals. Partnerships can also extend your capabilities by identifying available technology, skills, resources, logistics, and data. And that concludes my presentation.